Hey guys, so this video is going to be over plant nutrition, how a plant collects everything that it needs. We're going to hope to keep it short and sweet and to the point, so let's try that. Okay, so plants obviously do need some things other than just sunlight and water. They also do need some nutrients, some minerals, and that's going to come more, or le more than likely from the soil in which they grow. I just thought that this was a funny picture because you always see dogs peeing on trees and plants, but you don't ever see trees peeing on dogs. And while to us, oh, the dog's marking its territory with its scent, to the plant, this is how it gets some of those vital nutrients through animal waste, because it has some of those molecules and some of those elements that plants so desperately need. So that was just a little comic relief. So plants are autotrophic but they're not autonomous. Autonomous means I don't need to put anything into you. You just keep making everything that you make without any kind of raw material input. You just do it. You're like a, a machine or a robot. But autotrophic means that once you have everything you need, you can do it all by yourself. So plants are autotrophic. They still have some needs. Those needs would be an energy source. They'll need inorganic compounds or molecules to act as raw materials. Those are the two main ones. So that energy is going to come in the form of sunlight, and the inorganic compounds are going to come from water, from carbon dioxide, and from dissolved minerals within the soil. Okay, so this, play, this slide is supposed to talk about where these nutrients are going to come from. These are the essential nutrients that all plants are going to need. So the carbon and the oxygen are going to come from carbon dioxide, which is going to be in the air. We're going to use these for, as raw materials to build things, macromolecules, glucose, stuff like that. Your hydrogen is going to come from water, H2O. Okay, That water is going to be in the soil. Now, don't forget, this oxygen is going to leave the plant in the form of free oxygen, through photosynthesis. Remember when we split that water molecule apart? That's where the oxygen goes. Now all three of these, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, are all going to come from the soil. These are dissolved minerals that will be in water, so they're in the soil. And we're going to use these for a bunch of different things. We're going to use them to make proteins. We're going to use them for nucleic acids. We're going to use them for phospholipids, for those cell membranes that we so desperately need. All right? We're going to use them to make enzymes. So they're really, really important. Now calcium, magnesium, and sulfur are also important. They're also coming from the soil. Um, we're going to see our sulfur a lot in our proteins. Magnesium, as you hopefully remember, is highly important for chlorophyll. And then calcium helps with ion regulation. Actually, hydrogen up here does too. We need that for our proton pump. Sorry, the handwriting so jacked up. All right, so that's where they're coming from. And these are some of the things that they'll be used to make or to build or to aid with. So along with the main minerals that I just showed you on that last slide, plants also require small amounts of the following um, minerals, which we call micronutrients. We call them micronutrients because they just really need a really, really small amount. In some cases, we're talking about 0.0001% of their total dry mass. So that's, that's not a whole lot. Most of these are involved in enzyme function as cofactors, so they help to promote the proper use and the proper um, behavior of the enzymes that your plant needs. And they are just things like chlorine and iron and magnesium and boron and zinc and nickel and oly um, molybium, but just small amounts of them. So we call them micronutrients. Now, when a plant isn't getting the right amount of nutrients, you can see that in its general appearance. Now, plants can't talk. They're not like animals or humans and tell you that, you know, I feel well or I feel like I have a nutrient deficiency, but they can show you that they don't feel well. 
And if you look at the overall health of your plants, the overall appearance of your plants, you can tell how healthy they are. Now, you guys all know that I suck when it comes to plants. Like, I can't keep them alive for nothing in the world. So my plants probably look like this constantly. Now, specific symptoms are going to be as a result of the lack of essential nutrients. And they have very specific telltale signs. So a, let me switch to my laser real quick. A healthy plant has nice glossy leaves. It's all an even tone of green or color of green. You know, nothing too disturbing to look at. When a plant is undergoing a phosphate deficiency, meaning the soil that it grows in doesn't have enough phosphorus or phosphate in it, you're going to see a purple to pinkish strip appear on your plant leaf. And it always happens on the perimeter of the leaf. If your plant resides in soil that is potassium deficient, in that same area on the perimeter, you will now see an orange to yellowish color just on the perimeter of the leaf, on the, the, the border of the leaf. When your plant lives in conditions that are nitrogen deficient, it's that same orange to yellowish color, but it changes location. This time it's more towards the center of the leaf. It's on, on the inside of the leaf. So just by looking at the general appearance of your plants, you can kind of tell what essential nutrients they have or don't have. Now these pictures are showcasing plants that are undergoing a magnesium deficiency. Now this, this plant is a healthy plant, nothing too terribly wrong with it. But these two, I mean it's the same plant pretty much, it's just under different conditions. In this one you can see an obvious difference between plant A and plant B. And then if you zoom in a little bit closer and you look at the color of the leaves, they don't really look as healthy and as green as they should. Well these plants are undergoing a magnesium deficiency. And it leads to a condition called chlorosis, which is just a yellowing of the leaf. Now, I reminded you that magnesium is essential in proper chlorophyll. If you don't have magnesium, your chlorophyll is going to suffer. And seeing as how your chlorophyll is what gives its pl the plant its nice green color and also helps with the gathering of sunlight for photosynthesis, this can explain why this plant has these yellow leaves. Now let's talk about the fact that it doesn't have as many leaves as it should, and the few leaves that it does have are really, really small. Well, the leaves are the site of photosynthesis where glucose is made, C6H12O6. That's what your plant is going to use as its food source. If it doesn't have the correct color, it can't gather in sunlight from the correct part of the spectrum, which will allow photosynthesis to take place as it should. So it means that this plant is making less glucose than it should, which means it has less food to, to grow and work based off of. So that would explain why you have such few leaves and the leaves are yellow. All right, so this is just to remind you, here's your magnesium. Okay, so let's talk about soils. And we're going to tie in this part of our lecture a little bit with some of that human impact stuff that we talked about when we did ecology back in the first six weeks of this class. Plants can't change location based on what's going on in their environment. So if your soil type changes and you don't have enough nitrogen anymore, the plant can't just pack up its little plant family and move to soils that have more nitrogen. They're kind of stuck where they are. So they're very much dependent on the quality of soil that they grow in. They're dependent on its texture or structure. So that means, you know, how big your soil particles are. And it's also dependent on the composition of your soil, how much organic and inorganic components are in that soil and how fertile that soil is. The better your soil composition, the better the texture, the healthier your plant. <coughs> So soil has layers, which you, I know you learned in like 6th or 7th grade. But the most important layer to a plant is going to be that top soil layer. Top to the middle layer tend to be the most important parts. And it's because that is the section that is going to be rich in organic matter. Now organic matter in soil is called hummus. And it's pretty much just all the, the decomposing live carbon-rich things that that exist in that part of the soil. So it's where dead organisms are broken down, where fecal matter is broken down, where you have fallen leaves and other organic um, things that you 
you know, it's just on your soil layer, and it's being reused and processed by bacteria and fungi. The thicker your hummus layer, the better your soil texture is going to be because it is going to be nice and soft and velvety. Those particles are going to be nice and small because they've been broken down constantly. And it's also going to be a reservoir for those minerals that your plant needs so that it can be fully functioning. Also within that top soil layer, you're going to have a lot of microbial organisms. Um, tons of bacteria and fungi and worms and protists and insects. And those are all very essential because by building their little tunnels and their channels and moving things around, they help to aerate the soil and they also help to cycle the soil so that all of the nutrients aren't just found in one place. They're constantly being moved around from the bottommost layer to the topmost layer and it's, it's all nice and even throughout. Now here's where it ties in ecologically is in terms of human impact. Um, not every country can grow enough food to support its population. And that could be because of the terrain of the country. Like if you live in an area that's completely mountainous, then there will be some challenges in terms of turning a mountain into viable farmland. If you live in a country where the soil just naturally isn't very, you know, it's, it's kind of hostile to plant life, it's not conducive to, to plant life, then it's going to be hard to do farming. If you think of places that are permanently frozen, like in the northern parts of Canada where their soil is pretty much frozen all year long, or you think of areas where because of us, either our best soil is underneath housing or it's not being utilized for farming, we're going to have some issues in terms of providing enough food for all the populations in the world. So taking care of the healthy soil that we do have is definitely a global concern. And when you think of us misusing or mistreating our, our soil or our earth, whatever, um, things like the Dust Bowl come to mind. So in the 1920s, there was a great lack of what we call soil conservation. No one really thought of the soil as needing to be taken care of. So everyone just kind of did whatever they needed to do and didn't give it a second thought. Things like growing the same crops year after year after year in the same location without ever replenishing any of those nutrients can have detrimental effects on the soil in that area. Things like the grazing of cattle over and over again in one particular area can also have effects where all of the plant material holding that topsoil together is eaten away and now there's nothing to prevent wind or water or any other kind of erosive forces from removing your topmost layer. Oops. So what are some things we can do to improve our soil health? And this, these are going to be things that we have to do globally. Well, we have to maintain a, health, a healthy environment. And that means that we have to input back into the soil some of the nutrients that our plants and our animals naturally take out of it. We have to find ways of producing a sustainable food supply. There are a lot of countries, like I said before, that can't produce enough to feed their population. Think of China, for example. You know how everything you look at these days says made in China? Well, China has to have enough revenue so that they can import as many of the products as they do. A lot of things like wheat and barley and oats get imported into China because the areas that they have that can be used for farming are used mostly for rice farming. Rice is not the only thing that Chinese people eat, believe it or not. Okay, then another thing we need to come up with is an economically viable farming industry. We need to have cattle because we do need meat products. And those cattle definitely need to eat food, but there has to be a balance and a cycle so that there's no overusage of anything. So some of the ways that farmers and, um, you know, people in this industry have come up with to kind of help solve this situation are things like contour plowing and cover crops and crop rotation. So crop rotation is pretty self-explanatory. We're not planting the same crop over and over again. We're not planting corn only or wheat only. We alternate what we plant because different plants are going to have different nutritional needs. So they'll take different amounts of things out of the soil. 
Crop cover just means that we're planting small shrub-like things, things we actually can gather food from, so like carrots or lettuce or cabbage, for example. And they help to knit the topsoil back together and replenish the health of the actual soil while still giving us foods that we can utilize for you know, feeding our population. Contour plowing is a method in which you kind of dig furrows or terraces so that some parts of the soil are utilized for planting while others kind of have a chance to rest and regain the nutrients that they've lost and then they'll cycle it out the next year. The ones that were resting the year before will be where we plant crops and the ones that had crops on them will be the ones that get to rest. Okay, so things like soil fertility, how much erosion soils are exposed to, how much water is available for watering crops, and how much forest is destroyed every year are global issues. They're things that all of us have to think about. And if you think about it, they're only issues because of the human race. Never was a problem before we decided to, you know, mess with nature. All right, so these are just some pictures that showcase some of the things I'm talking about. Um, here's some example of terracing here. And here, these are actually paddy fields. Um, here we have banana trees. This is a very good crop cover type of, of plant because they don't grow very tall. Um, you have things like the slash and burn method that's going on right here. These are different methods of irrigating um, plants. These are This is something called hydroponics where instead of growing your plants in soil, you grow them in water that have the same nutrients dissolved within them. So just some different methods. Okay, fertilizers. So there are two kinds of fertilizers, organic and inorganic. Organic would be things like composting, for example, saving all of your scraps from your kitchen and putting that on your flower beds. So manure or fish meal or compost, you know, things that you naturally have. You're not putting any chemicals per se in. And then we have chemical fertilizers. Chemical fertilizers have pretty much the same nutrients that this, these organic fertilizers will have. They'll have nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium, but they are commercially manufactured within a certain ratio. So, like your miracle Grow, for example. How do we increase soil fertility? Well, cover crops. Pretty much, you grow a bunch of plants that are fairly small. You give them a chance to knit the soil back together. You can harvest some of them, but you leave the majority of them in place, and then you plow them into your soil so that when they do decompose, they decompose and release their nutrients right into the soil. So it's a way of putting nitrogen right back into the soil. All right, now there are, oh, sorry. We, we can go back and pull in evolution and natural selection while we talk about plants and their nutrition. So let's do that for a little bit. Now, I was telling 1B that animals, and especially humans, have the ability to change their environment to suit their needs. Plants can't do that. Instead, plants have two options. They either die because they can't make it, or they adapt to the environment in which they're found. But they can't change what's going on around them. They can only really change themselves. So plants have adapted to a bunch of different environments, and we'll step through them. Let's start with arid environments. So arid just means that you're dry, not a lot of water. So right away you should be thinking things like desert. And some of the adaptations that plants will have to a dry and arid environment would be things like having <coughs> excuse me, having a thick cuticle and having few stomata on their leaves. And um, if they do have any, they'll have them on the underside and not on the top side. Another adaptation is actually growing hairs on your leaves. Those hairs are called trichomes. And they tend to be a light color, like white or cream, which allows them to reflect light from the actual surface of the leaf, and that reduces the rate of transpiration. Some plants that have leaves with stomata on both sides can actually have those stomata located in what we call surface pits. They're little depressions within the leaf. So 
By lowering where the stomata is found, it increases water tension in the leaf and it reduces the rate of transpiration. Another method is to have spine-like, well, to convert your leaves into spikes, pretty much, kind of like a cactus. And so instead of making your leaves your main area of photosynthesis, you make your stems completely green and your stems are where photosynthesis takes place. So the stems are adapted to do photosynthesis, but they're also adapted to store water. And those spiky-like needles will prevent other animals from wanting to eat you. And you don't have this great surface area from which you're losing water. So those are some adaptations that plants can have for dry environments. Okay, then we need to think about areas that have too much water. Um, we see this a lot in Grenada, especially in the areas where we have lakes. The lake, the floodplain of the lake or the floodplain of the river extends almost into actual soil. And a lot of the plants in that area can't really survive because there's too much water. So what, is the, what are the issues when we have flooding or when we have more water than we should? Well, the roots are underwater, which means that they can't get the oxygen they need for cellular respiration, and they can't make ATP if they can't do cellular respiration. Another thing could be that leaves may dry out. And I know that sounds weird, but the leaves could dry out in a case where you have flooding, and that causes um, your entire plant to die because it's, there's no food being made. How would these leaves dry out? Well... If your roots are constantly underwater, constantly covered completely by water, they're probably rotting and they don't have any energy, like the cells don't have any energy. So the ability of the root to really take up water as it normally would kind of is reduced because those cells are dying. Remember, it's all about osmosis. It's all about permeability. Another issue is that the hormones that promote root growth and root synthesis can be suppressed because of the presence of excess water. So too much water definitely isn't good, just like not enough water also isn't good. Okay, so what are some adaptations a plant can have to a watery environment? Well, if you live in a wet environment, you tend to form more pores. <laughs> so when you live in a dry environment, you try to keep the amount of pores you have under control. So not a, not a lot of stomata. But when you live in a wet environment, you create another kind of pore. These are called lenticles, and lenticles are found on the stems of the plant. So stomata on the leaves and lenticles on the stem. You can also form a type of root system excuse me, that are called adventitious roots. And adventitious roots can pretty much grow from any part of the plant. So they're not going to be underground. They're not going to be underwater per se. They're going to be in the actual atmosphere, so almost in the shoot system. And this prevents those leaves, those roots, sorry, from becoming waterlogged, and they allow for gas exchange, which means that we can do cellular respiration. Some plants, like water lilies, will have stomata only on the surface of the leaf. So they won't have it underneath the leaf because that's the part of the leaf that's in contact with water. The surface is for the most part dry, so that's where they'll put their stomata, so that way they can still do transpiration if necessary. Other plants have the ability to form air-like chambers or gas bubbles, for lack of a better term, from which gas exchange can happen between the plant above the water and the, the, the tissues that are still underneath the water. So there's some ways of dealing. Okay, what about saline conditions, salty conditions? Well, soil salinity around the world is increasing. So our, so our soil is actually getting saltier, which is kind of odd when you think about it. Living plants will die if there's too much salt in the soil. So that's not good. On the bright side, some plants have adapted to growing in a saline condition, and those plants are called halophytes. Hmm. Now this word looks familiar. I wonder if that was one of your root words recently. Might have been. Anyway, so halophytes have spongy leaves with water that's stored inside of the leaf and that can dilute water in the roots. So water is still picked up in the roots, but it's stored, like literally stored in the leaves until salt conditions are too high in the roots and then the plant will transfer that stored water back to the roots to dissolve the amount of salt that's there. 
Um, other plants have determined ways of actively transporting salt out of the roots or blocking the salt so that it can't enter the roots at all. Yet others produce high concentrations of organic molecules in the roots to alter water potential within the roots. So if we change the water potential, it doesn't affect our ability to pick up water because that's another situation that we have to worry about. There's a lot of salt in the roots. We're not going to have osmosis happen in the direction that we need it to. So by producing organic molecules that still change the concentration of water, then water can still flow into the roots. All right, now these are my favorite. Um, these are the ways that some plants have adapted to nutritional issues. So we have a lot of plants that are parasitic, and one of the funny ones are, are mistletoe. And I think it's funny because, you know, at Christmas time, it's the whole, oh, if you're standing under the mistletoe, you're supposed to kiss. So a plant that we kind of use to promote love and affection is actually a parasitic plant that kills its host. But, you know, I just find that interesting. So mistletoe and Indian pipe are two good examples of parasitic plants. And literally what these are going behind are the vascular system of their host plant. So they tap straight into the xylem of these host plants. And instead of getting water on their own, they utilize the water that that plant is taking up for itself. Okay, another type, is these aren't parasitic, but in Scotland and Ireland, there are these areas called peat bogs. And peat bogs, they're kind of, they look like swamp, but it's covered in this green stuff that's called peat. Now, under certain conditions, peat can be very, very acidic. And what it does is it kind of prevents um, the nutrients in the soil from being utilized by other plants in the area. Like the peat is taking control of everything around it. Then we have carnivorous plants. These really are cool. Now they're not carnivorous in the true sense. They don't really eat meat. They're utilizing these insects and these birds and these bats that they do quote unquote consume for the nitrogen in their bodies. The areas that these carnivorous plants grow in don't have nitrogen in the soil. So they get everything else they need except nitrogen. And that's what they're using this poor little fly or whatever for. It's for the nitrogen. It's not for anything else. So my favorite is the sundew because it always looks so pretty. But it's really, really deadly. Um, it has these little sticky droplets on it that smell really sweet. So it's attractive to insects that normally would feed on nectar. So the little fly lands... And then the plant can control all of these little stalks that this little droplet is on. So when the, plant la when the insect lands, it gets trapped because that droplet is sticky. And then the plant bends all of its other tendrils and droplets and covers up the insect so that it can't get away and then absorbs the nitrogen out of its body. Another cool one is the Venus flytrap. And Venus flytraps are literally traps. So they're also sweet smelling. These right here are their leaves. And the little extensions don't really hurt. They're not pointy or anything like that. But they do interlock, preventing whatever the, um, the flytrap is trapped from getting out. And they have these little hairs that exist on their leaves. So fly flies in and it brushes up against one hair. It kind of sets off a trigger. Once that trigger has been set off, <coughs> excuse me, the fly has ten, about 10 seconds to leave and not be harmed. But if it brushes up against another hair trigger, then the whole, the, the two leaves will snap shut, again, absorbing the nitrogen from its body. So another cool one are these guys. These are called pitcher plants, and I have another picture of them on this one. They come in a lot of different varieties. And they're called pitcher plants because this is their one of their um, flower-like projections. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Um, the reason they're called pitcher plants is because they can hold liquid, like a pitcher will hold water. So down at the very bottom is whatever rainwater that's collected over time because these guys are opened up, like these leaves don't close up ever. Now on the actual surface, like right here where my laser is, it feels like a normal leaf. 
But once the insect gets into this region, the entire inner wall of these plants are all coated in a, um, it's not really slimy, but it's a slick material. So when those flies or whatever try to climb back up the plant, they can't, they keep sliding down. And eventually they drown in the liquid at the bottom and then the plant absorbs the nitrogen from their body. So, all right, so that's it, guys. I hope it wasn't too bad, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.